Tonight is our Acts 19 night. Uh, Paul, when he went to Ephesus, uh, did something amazing. When he got there, there were only those who had heard of the Old Testament and of the baptism of John, and they really needed to connect things together. And so he began preaching the gospel, and as people were saved, it says that he would, on his siesta lunchtime that they observed in Ephesus, he rented a hall, a lecture hall, the school of Tyrannus it's called, and he, he met on his lunch hour and dialogued. He, he explained what the Bible said, where the question uh, that they had was, and how you connected uh, their question, their desire to the scriptures. And so uh, a while back the elders were saying, uh, what are your plans for the future? I said, well, what, you know, I mean, I could preach endlessly on anything. What are you thinking about? And one of them said, well, you know, people love question and answer nights. I said, well, we'll do a couple this summer. So um, basically I have several that uh, were either slipped under the door, emailed, or whatever, and I'm going to write them down so I don't forget them. Um, someone asked me in person, they said, would you explain uh, why you talk while you're reading the scriptures? I'm, I'm honest, they did. And so I'm going to explain that. Uh, then someone said, could you explain to us, um, well, they asked me personally, and then they said, you know what, you ought to tell other people that. They said, um, could you explain um, your preaching style? I said, sure. I mean, you know, if you want me to. And then someone sent an email, and they said, we've been studying Melchizedek, uh, all summer or in, in the uh, home groups. Uh, of course, I've been in 12 by 12 and I haven't been in that, but I do know um, John MacArthur's study on Hebrews. And they said, could you relate Melchizedek to us non-Jewish people? Why there's so much space? I mean, a whole chapter, uh, you know, Hebrews 7 given to him. So we'll talk about Melchizedek. And then just now walking out here, I got this one under the door. Uh, Pastor John, will you explain Romans 11:26? And then they quote it, uh, all Israel will be saved. And then they say, my take on this is the Redeemer coming to Zion, Jerusalem, his second coming, and only those who say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord will be spared to enter the kingdom. Please help me fully understand. Thank you. So um, the all Israel, Romans 11, actually it's Romans 9 through 11, you know, the whole thing, but uh, all Israel saved. So... Um, one, two, three. So I have four questions up until now, but I was wondering if anybody has some because I'm looking for an easier one. Uh, so uh, if, and we have a microphone right there, and I thought if anybody is just, I mean, you're dying to ask a question. I'm probably not going to get to answering it, especially if it's really hard. But uh, if you're dying to ask, you can just come up. Anybody you just couldn't sleep tonight if you don't? You have to come to the microphone. And... Uh, and we'll see. Okay, I'll write this one down. I'm ready. Uh, okay, um, I had a friend who called me and she said that her pastor was preaching and he said it was not a literal um, six-day creation because she said yom and that it was a, this day, a, you know, this length of day. And I told her, no, 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 that's not right. And, but I needed to know where to direct her. So. Okay, the, the use of the, the Hebrew word yom, the day, in Genesis and uh, creation, um, whether it's uh, uh, six day creation or six something creation, good. Um, so now we have five. Okay, I see, oh, more. <laughs> I'm sure you've answered this, but uh, Christian and alcohol. Christian and alcohol don't mix well, but we'll, we'll uh, <laughs> Christian and alcohol, um, that's a good question. Hey, oh welcome goodness. back from Israel. Yes, welcome back. Um, I had a question on Moses. I've been taught Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, is it true that it was all oral tradition? You read in the Bible in a later period that um, there was a lot of books, and these books were used to write judges and kings and so forth. So did Moses really compile the, four, the first five books of the Bible, 
or was it all oral tradition? Pat, that is a good question. That's, that's enough, okay? We don't want very many more. Um, you know, that's, there, there are two, you actually have two parts, the documentary hypothesis that they call it, and the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. So, um, wow. Well, this should get us way through nine o'clock. And so, uh, uh, but just to help me remember, I'll just knock off the, the easy ones. Uh, on why I have you stand, and I read the scriptures, but I make you stand an inordinate amount of time while I talk about it, is because someone I deeply admire does that. And so look in your Bibles, and I want to show you, and this will help you understand maybe uh, how I think. Nehemiah chapter 8. Um, it's very interesting how Nehemiah records uh, one of my great heroes. One of my great biblical heroes is Ezra. Uh, Ezra is the second most revered figure in Judaism, right after the one that Pat was talking about, Moses, but number two among the Jewish people. And I don't mean the people having, you know, bagels in New York City. I'm talking about Bible, you know, Bible studying, um, Tanakh studying, Jews uh, that really are into Bible study. They love Ezra because they realize that Ezra is the father of, of modern Judaism. I mean, he's the one that started the synagogue. He's the one that created modern biblical Hebrew. Uh, he is the one that, that copied the Bible into readable text because by the time of Ezra, 500 B.C., no Jew could read the Bible, not one, because it was written in such... It would be kind of like us reading a 16th century version of Beowulf. I mean, you wouldn't even, the B's or S's, and it's so confusing, and, and the words are so different. And so, but here's what Ezra did. I, I love this. This is Ezra's method. Um, he's reading the law in chapter 8, uh, verse 5. He opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was standing above all the people. When he'd opened it, the people stood up. So they all stand up, and he starts reading distinctly, verse 8, from the book, in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. In other words, as he read, he, he just, he didn't expound a whole sermon on every word, he just helped them understand. Like, I don't know how many times I've said, the angel of the church of this is not an angel as you're talking about, it's a messenger and most likely it's the pastor. It, it's it's just explaining as you go along because Ezra did. So for the person that asked me that, that's the reason I do it. And after they asked me that, they said, well, um, could you make it real clear when you're talking, when God's talking? And I said, I sure will. Um, you know, I'll say, look up or, you know, something like that. And I'm trying to do that. But it's because Ezra, as he read, he knew that, that, that some of the people didn't understand the word, maybe they didn't know the Old Testament allusion, and so he just explained it because not everybody has a study Bible and has looked everything up, and so that's why. Uh, the second one, and these are just easy ones, because uh, the second one is, what is your preaching style? And I'll draw you a picture to show you my preaching style, because um, this is a picture I drew them. They said, um, we... We are used to this, um, that, that the pastor stays in one text and, and does that text, and the next week he does that text and that text, and um, he stays there. And, and I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, they said, and their context was, they said, when I was in uh, Revelation 1, 15, I said that the, Jesus was, you know, with white hair and his eyes of fire, and I said, and he was wearing this robe and this sash, and I talked about Jesus as the perfect priest, and um, they said, it doesn't say priest anywhere in verse 15, and, you know, Revelation, let me just put it this way, Revelation 1, 15, there is no priest in that verse, and I said, oh, I said, you're thinking about textual preaching, textual preaching uh, when you're in seminary, textual preaching means that you stick with the text, the verse you're on. And you just, you, you go through, uh, for God so loved the world. 
And you don't talk about um, how many times love is in the whole book of John, and you don't talk about God, and you don't talk about what the world means and how John uses it in all of his five epistles. You just talk about verse 16 of John 3. And that's called textual preaching. And I said, that is a wonderful, valid, useful, powerful method. But I, and this is the Bible right here. It's like every verse in textual preaching is sitting at the pinnacle of the Bible. And you, you don't talk about this massive understructure. You only talk about that verse. And that's a wonderful method of preaching, but it's not one that I do very often. I mean, maybe, you know, uh, very, very occasionally, I'll just, like, if I'm assigned a verse at a missions conference or something like that, you know, and I try and be obedient um, to that. Actually, I look at it this way. Whatever text that I am preaching on, on any given week, or any given place or time or anything else, um, I look at it like all 31,000 verses of the Bible. Uh-oh, there we go, got to use the right side of this pen. All 31,000 verses of the Bible are pressing down on that portion of Scripture. Uh, and so if I'm in, you know, Revelation, you know, 2 this morning, 12 to 17, I am looking at any part of any, any word, any concept, any topic, any allusion, any um, at all correlation with that text from the entire Bible. So that's why when I'm in Revelation 1.15, I know that Jesus Christ is forever our great high priest. I mean, it says that in Hebrews. And so it doesn't have to say those words in Revelation 1 because we know it's already true because God inspired the whole, all of the Bible was supernaturally engineered and it's all connected together, kind of like the synaptic connections of our brain. Uh, neurologists tell us that there is many connections in every one of our brains sitting here as there are stars in the universe. There are about 600 quadrillion connections and stars. That's the most amazing thing to think about, how much connection God has given us in our minds. And he has made all the verses of the Bible to be supernaturally knit together because the Holy Spirit was the author and the, the, the one who supernaturally engineered 40 different human authors, most of whom never saw each other, to all, to all totally agree. And every piece of the Bible fits together. I mean, this is like a, an inverted pyramid. If you've ever seen the, the Egyptian pyramids, they're amazing marvels. Did you know that all the blocks of the Bible were made across three continents by 40 different individuals over 1,600 years that never met each other, most of them, and yet each block totally fits. And within each block, there is an amazing what the reformers called the analogia scriptura, that every part of the scripture is explained by a different part of scripture. And the more you know the whole. And so the reason I operate this way is that when I was uh, 19 years old, I had only read the Bible through one time. And I did that to go to camp when I was 13, you know. Uh, free camp if you read the Bible through. And so I did it. I mean, uh, what a good motivation, you know, but at least I did it. Uh, but I was sitting at age 19 at Bob Jones University in a class on how to teach the Bible, and this 80 or 90-year-old man was teaching us, and, and I sat there with my mouth open, not asleep, in shock, because he knew the Bible so well. And I went right up to him at the end, and I said, how did you just do what you just did? And he looked at me and said, Sonny, you know, and I was a Sonny back then. Uh, he said, Sonny, he said, you'll never teach the Bible until you've read it through at least once for every year you are old. And, and he says, that's what I have done. And, and he was mid-80s, so he'd read the Bible 80 sometimes. And so I started at age 19 reading the Bible through, and uh, by the end of my 19th year, I'd made it through 12 times, once a month, plus my one, I'd gotten up to 13. And when I turned age 20, 
I continued that and added 12 more, and I surpassed my age and got through my 25th time. And so, and I've just kept on doing that. And so, when I think of the Bible, I think of, of it just like the circuit board lights up. That's why I, I can listen to, somebody said, um, I don't get anything out of when you preach. And I said, that's amazing. I, I listen to people that are even preaching error and I get something out of it. Do you know why? My mind is lighting up and I'm going, oh, doesn't it say this? Doesn't it say that? Doesn't it say this? Because if you spend enough time in the Bible, it just starts all fitting together. And so for that question, um, that's my method. And so if in Revelation 2, 12 through 17, um, like uh, we're going to see, Lord willing, if the Lord tarries and if I'm still alive next week, we're going to see what happens at Pergamum is really what most of us see today in, in the kind of ecumenical mess that's in the world where people don't know any doctrine and most churches are teaching a salvation by works. It all started back in that Pergamite era when paganism came into the church. In fact, uh, the whole, and um, I don't want to go too far on this, but the whole mother-child thing, you know, the, like the Pieta in the Vatican that has Mary and baby Jesus, you know, or, or actually the Pieta is Jesus off the cross, the young man, but the whole, if you see much Roman Catholic art, you see Mary and a baby Jesus right there. That mother-child is through all religions. You can find that in the Aztecs, you can find that in South American religion, you can find that in Egyptian religion, you can find that. That predates Christianity, the mother-child. And that obsession that we see now in the Roman Catholic Church, that was imported by the time of Constantine when Roman Catholic Church started. That was imported. No early church believers uh, saw Mary in that elevated position. Um, Jesus put her in her place very clearly as we've talked about on Mother's Day. And that idea the, of the mother co-mediatrix kind of helping Jesus with salvation, all that, came about in the fourth century. And so, um, but when I get to that, it will be because there are elements in uh, Revelation 2 that are also in Jeremiah. Remember, Revelation has only 404 verses, but it quotes the Old Testament or alludes to it over 800 times. And in the book of Jeremiah, it talks about the children of Israel worshiping Tammuz. That's the mother. Baal was the son. And the mother-son deal is in and making little cakes for her and, and asking her for her blessing and favor. That is so tied to, to this um, idea of religious syncretism that, that we see in the Pergamite church, which is Roman Catholicism. And so that's how I'll get to that. So that's my preaching style, and, uh, uh, but I, I like both. And, and what I say is that the more of the scriptures, the more truly it is expositional um, as opposed to textual, which limits itself just to within that verse, but both deal with the Word of God, and both are wonderful. So, okay, those were the easy ones. Ooh, talk too long on the easy ones. Okay, now let's go to Melchizedek real quickly, uh, right here. Melchizedek is only three times in the Bible, and uh, I guess they ask, why is it so important for us non-Jewish people to know about Melchizedek? So, uh, whenever you're studying uh, any topic in the Scriptures, uh, I mean, you just you do an, an analysis and kind of take apart the scriptures, and you find that Melchizedek is only in three places in the scripture: uh, Genesis 14, Psalm 110, and Hebrews 7. Now, immediately, my mind starts thinking about this. Genesis 14, that's with Abraham, was about 2000 BC. Psalm 110, as David wrote it, was about 1000 BC. And Hebrews 7 is, you know, sometime before the destruction of Jerusalem, so somewhere in the 60s A.D. So we're talking about one person that's talked about over a 2,000-plus year, almost 2,100-year period of time in three different scriptures, and, and you start saying, why would God in Hebrews 7 say so much about this this very mysterious figure. So for just a second, we won't go very long. Look at Genesis 14 with me, and let's look at Melchizedek. And uh, 
I'll just tell you, basically, there, there are three views of who Melchizedek is. Um, one is that he's kind of like a good guy, Balaam. If you remember, Balaam in um, Exodus 32 to 34 is the one that, well, we're going to see him in the church in Pergamos. But he was the prophet for hire, and, and, but he knew God. And he knew the true and living God, and he communicated with God. He knew God's name. He knew how to be in touch with God, but he was a bad guy. Well, Melchizedek in Genesis 14 also knows God. He knows him very well. In fact, he knows him and calls him by his name that that is one of his great names, you know, the the God Most High. But but look, you know, the the whole battle of uh, the kings uh, taking Lot and and all that and Abraham... um, pursuing him, verse 14, as far as Dan. But this is where it gets interesting in verse 18, Genesis 14, 18. Then, out of the blue, nowhere before mentioned, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of, and there's that El Elyon name of God, God Most High. Now, you remember every time a demon gets all fired up in the presence of Christ, do you remember what they say? We know who you are. You're, and they'll either use this title or another title. They'll call you the Holy One of God or you are the, the one of the Most High God. This, this seems to be a spirit world well-known title that, that, that the Lord is the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, verse 19, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, and it's, now it describes this name of God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that's Abraham, verse 20 at the end, gave him, that's Melchizedek, a tithe of all. Now that, that is very interesting. Now the kings of Sodom said to Abraham, Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of, of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and I will take nothing but a thread uh, nothing from a thread to a sandal strap that I will not take anything as yours lest you should say I've made Abraham rich and accept only what the young men and he finishes off saying you know I don't want anybody to think that you helped Abraham God most high did I mean that is a not a lot of stuff and from that first mention of both Jerusalem and Melchizedek we have in Psalm 110 the Lord saying Uh, I swear that you're going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who was Melchizedek? That's the question. Why would would this happen? Then the whole, turn over to chapter 7 of Hebrews, look at what it's talking about in Hebrews 7. And those of you, this is familiar ground if you're in our home groups. For Melchizedek, 7-1, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all. By the way, you want to know something that's a little unnerving for all the you know, people that say we're not under the law, we don't tithe? This is before the law. Isn't that interesting? Moses didn't invent tithing. Abraham, to show honor to God before there was any Mosaic law, no diet, no Sabbath day, nothing. Moses wrote all that down. But this concept, was, was known before that to honor God, you give him the tenth. And so I always remember uh, when I was talking with John MacArthur about this, when I was starting out, a newlywed, you know, struggling to live in Los Angeles as expensive as it was, and I said, John, what do you do? And he says, I don't want to be a legalist. He said, I don't ever want any legalism, so I never give 10%. He said, I give 11. <laughs> you know what the average American gives? The average church-going evangelical American? 1%. And they think that's huge for God. As long as we're on tithing, whoever asked this question, thanks for asking it. I've been waiting for a long time to talk about this. <laughs> it's not like 10% belongs to God and I get the other 90%. It's like 100% belongs to God. And my goal in life is not to see how much of the money God has richly given me I can spend, but how much I can put at his disposal and to think of leveraging every dime so that I can have the largest home and the newest car is a very ungodly, 
unbiblical thought. It's American, but it's not biblical. The, the goal is not how much we can amass. It's how much we can sacrificially show the lordship of Christ over in our lives. So thanks, whoever stuck this uh, uh, you know, under my door to get me started on that. But let's get back to Melchizedek. Who was he? Well, basically, he, if you're in the study, you know that, that he uh, is a contrast. We have the Aaronic priesthood, uh, and we have the Melchizedekian priesthood. And if you know anything about Aaron, it was hereditary. Uh, you could just, uh, hereditary, you could just be a priest as long as you're in the right family. And as you know, there were some rascals, and there were some good ones. And uh, there were drunken children of, of uh, Aaron that got burned up by the Lord and other things. So, and we'll come to that with the Christian and alcohol. Uh, but with Melchizedek, it, it was very personal. It shows that God picked him. Um, another thing about the Aaronic priesthood was these were just men, um, and, and basically uh, that were dying. You know, we all are, are dying. Melchizedek is described as having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Uh, he, he is pictured as being timeless. Um, and, and, you know, there's, so, I mean, you're doing this in the study. You can do this. But what Melchizedek is, is it is um, a picture of what Christ will do. Like the Aaronic only dealt with Israel. I mean, they were only priests for the nation of Israel. Melchizedek is a priest that the kings of Sodom are recognizing, that Abraham, the, the one from Ur of the Chaldees, is talking to long before there was an Israel. And so he is uh, what we could call global or, or international or whatever. It's a worldwide priesthood. Um, and so why Melchizedek is so important is he becomes what we call a type um, of Christ, that, that Christ would be a personal priest, that, that he is an eternal priest. That's what the whole goal of, of Hebrews 7 is. He has a, an, a never-ending priesthood that saves us to the uttermost. And he isn't just saving the Jews, even though Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, but he's also so loved the world. And so you can do the rest of the study, but I still haven't answered who was he. And so uh, there are three views of that, and I will just briefly tell you what they are, and I'll tell you the one I like. Um, Melchizedek could be one of three things. Either he could be a good Balaam. In other words, uh, some pagan that came to know the Lord and, um, and knew access. So he was kind of like a good priest um, that knew God but predates, predates any uh, revelation that's written down. And that's a view of some. We still don't know where Balaam came from. Balaam, Balaam knew how to get directly in touch with God, which few people in the Bible knew. So Balaam is a, a mystery. The one thing about Balaam, though, is Balaam wanted to, by his own words, he says, let me die the death of the righteous. He says that. But you know what? He didn't want to live the life of the righteous. And so Balaam is forever a picture of someone that's talk but didn't possess. That, that he talked about God. Uh, God was near in his mouth but far in his heart. And as far as we know, uh, Balaam is going to be suffering the blackness of darkness forever. Eternal perdition. Because he wanted to die the death of the righteous without living the life of the righteous. In other words, a life of faith. But So he was a good priest. Number two, uh, some say that he was a theophany. Melchizedek was. Theophany, if you ever heard of that word, theo, uh, means God, phanos is in a bodily form. Or a Christophany, um, which is the same idea, Christos, Christ, in a body. Um, a pre-incarnate um, visitation of Christ. And the reason they say that is because how could someone be the king of a Canaanite city like Salem and be godly? Because the Canaanites were so wicked. 
Remember Moses said the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet fully worked. In fact, when they excavate around Israel, they hardly show the people what they find. It's so horrible, the Canaanite culture. They were baby murderers. I mean, they used to bury babies alive in jars. When they built something, they just put a living baby in there and seal it up and offer it to the gods. I mean, they were cold, cruel, heartless, murderous. Their perversion sexually is, is even makes Jewish archaeologists blush. They're so perverted, the Canaanites, as they excavate their stuff. And so people say the Canaanites are so bad, um, how could anybody but Christ be the king of Salem? Then there's a third view, which I think is very interesting, and that is, for everybody on earth, there would be three people that, as it says here, if you look back in verse 3 of Hebrews 7, without father, without mother, without genealogies, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. This would be someone that just kind of like they couldn't figure out. Like he lived longer than everybody else. Seems like he wasn't going to die. And he, he kind of was old when people just started coming around. And it's like, like he's from somewhere else. And there is, there, there is someone like that. And his name is Shem if you think about it. Because Noah had three sons and those three were a hundred years old when they stepped off the ark. So they were already old. But after the ark, after the flood of Noah, people began living normal basic lifespans. A little elongated but not really anything. And Shem lived 500 plus years if you read what it says in Genesis 11. And so here's what I mean. Shem lived 400 years after the flood. That means that Shem would have been around for about 100 and, 100 and lots, 100 plus years, I don't have my chronology in front of me, of Abraham's life. So Shem easily could have lived in Jerusalem. Why? Because Japheth lived in Joppa. You know, you remember Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Do you remember what they did? If this is the ark, Japheth went down to Joppa and his family became what we call the Europeans. Those are the Japhitic tribes. Uh, and if you're ever interested in this, there's a guy named uh, Bill, mm -hmm. Bill, I'll think of it in a second. He spent his whole lifetime, he's a British guy, um, he spent his whole lifetime studying the table of nations that's in Genesis 10. Genesis 10 says that from the ark overspread the earth 70 families, and it names every family. And it, it gives a specific name, you know, the Mizraim and the uh, Kethraim and the Luddites and blah, 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 all these, you know, 70 names. And Japheth's family... Ham's family, they went south. They became the equatorial people, the hot country people. They became, you know, Africa, the coastal areas, and, and Ham's descendants. Some of them actually went a little north and became the Canaanites. And if you remember, that's who Noah cursed. Then there's Shem. And Shem is the Semitic peoples, the people of the Middle East. Abraham was a descendant. So it's very possible that Shem is one of the, I mean, Shem fits with the good priest and the theophany thing quite well because all of them we don't know. But it's very interesting that if you do the chronology, it appears that Shem died the same year as the 127-year-old Sarah died. And so if you know anything about Abraham's life, he must have really mourned that year because he lost possibly this person that knew God from before the flood and told him about, you know, Noah. And Noah would have known all the way back, I mean, through his relatives, would have known and heard of Adam. And so this touch all the way to creation, Shem would have brought all the way here to Abraham's life. But um, this 
this book that's written is fascinating because this man, Bill, whatever his name is, um, his book is called After the Flood. That's the title of it, After the Flood. And if you're one of these people who likes to read intriguing stuff, he spent 30 years of his life systematically going through the archives of Denmark, of Scotland, of England, of Germany, of Italy, of Spain, and then he went to the Middle East, and he went through Turkey's and Syria's, and you know, he spent, and, and he finished this book in the, I think in the 70s, and uh, it used to be sold by uh, Institute of Creation Research because it's so fascinating. What he found is every one of the 70 families that are listed in Genesis 10, every one of them, you can find in the royal archives of these countries exactly spelled the same. Now these people don't study the Bible, they don't even believe the Bible, and they don't even care what's in their archives, but the earth is not as old, and that will get up to uh, uh, this question here. The earth is not as old as a lot of people think, because Shem most likely knew Abraham, Shem's dad most likely had first-hand accounts of Adam. And it's very possible Shem was Melchizedek because he would have known the Lord. And he would have appeared to be, verse 3, he would have appeared to be without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of life nor end of days, but made like the Son of God. So that's a possibility. Uh, probably the one that, that most theologians favor would be this middle one. Um, and then others are here, and others are here. But that's why Melchizedek is here, to show the type of the perfection of Christ's priesthood. But who he was, this gives you an example of what theologians do when they have very little to work with. Genesis 14 is only that long. But if you do the math, and there's no reason to believe that the Bible means anything other than it says, that Shem lived after the flood, uh, about 400 years, and so he would have been synonym or contemporary with Abraham. Okay, so as long as we're talking about that, let's talk about the the flood and Yom and all that, and or creation. I mean, in the days, um, that is probably the most often asked question, especially when I do college uh, retreats and things like that, because kids are bombarded with evolutionary thought, and they don't know how to answer it because. They've heard Hugh Ross um, on James Dobson's show, and Hugh Ross is an astrophysicist who is an evolutionist, um, who James Dobson brought on as an expert uh, about 20 years ago. And Hugh Ross, his name is Hugh Ross, and uh, Hugh Ross believes uh, what we would call normal evolutionary thought, and he believes that Adam was created right here, um, you know, right at this point, but God created the universe back here and billions and billions of years passed and there was a um, subhuman um, caveman race that had little brains and no spirits. Uh, they were not in the image of God and they were hacking and killing each other and eating each other and painting on the walls and chasing dinosaurs, and then all that, uh, you know, got into the strata, and then God created this perfect Eden, and then Adam fell into sin, and the Bible goes like this. So what Hugh Ross did is, and, and by the way, a lot of his work is phenomenal. I love it. The anthropic principle is, he's a genius. What he says is that the earth is so precisely tilted, distanced from the sun, rotational speed, revolution speed, everything about the earth, it was the anthropic principle is that, that the earth was totally made for humans. That's why uh, scientists are amazed. I mean the color of our star, the age of the sun. If the sun was younger or older, we couldn't live. If the sun was further away or closer, we couldn't live. If the earth spun faster or slower, we couldn't live. If it wasn't on that cute little angle, we couldn't live. It just, everything about it, I mean, if it was spinning too fast, the oxygen would fly off. If it was spinning too slow, the carbon dioxide would smother us all. I mean, if it was too far away from the sun, we'd freeze. If it was too close, we would all boil. It'd be like this week, you know, all the time. And, and so everything about it, and so 
Hugh Ross is a genius. And, and the only thing, though, that's sad is that he, he wanted to accommodate evolutionary thought. And the purpose of evolution among non-believers is to make a creator far away or not at all. Because who wants this God that recently made us? Maybe he's going to ask us to answer for our lives. And so we want to get everybody to be kind of an animal. And so then we can act like animals and not feel bad about it. And that's the purpose of evolution. It's for, for humans to find a way around a creator, a judge, accountability, etc. But how do you, from the Bible, support what I would call recent, literal, six-day creationism? And I'm glad that you asked that, because I remember I was unpacking my books in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was literally unpacking my books. And my secretary said, you have a call. I said, wonderful. Who is it? She said, oh, it's John Erling. And I said, oh, does he go to church here? She said, no. She said, he is the talk show everyone in Tulsa listens to. Him all day long, and then they switch to Rush Limbaugh, and as soon as Rush is off, they're back to John Erling. And he opens the day and closes the day, and he's the most well-known voice of Tulsa. And they said, he always calls every pastor that moves in and asks them a question on the air. And he's on the air right now, and you're going to answer it. She says, we didn't want you to worry, so we didn't tell you. Well, it was wonderful. So I just sat down, you know, brushed off my chair, grabbed my Bible, and I answered the phone. He says, he says uh, so good to have you on the show, Pastor. Welcome to Tulsa. I said, thank you. He said, I have another pastor on the phone, too. And it was a pastor of the huge United Whatever Church downtown, one of those looks like Notre Dame in Paris, one of those giant edifices. And this guy was in a mainline denomination, did not believe in the deity of Christ, did not believe in the inspiration of Scripture, didn't believe any miracles happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he'd just been, this pastor had been telling all this on the air, you know, very, he had this scholarly voice. And he, John Erling, had said, hey, what about people that believe in recent literal creationism? He said, he said, do you know anybody like that? And he said, well, I think the new guy that just moved here is one of them. And so that's why they called tricked me. And so I had not heard all this stuff. And this liberal pastor said, you know, he says there's nobody that's real person before Abraham. We're not even sure about him. David's the first real person that's in the Bible. All the rest of them are just mythology. And all this had gone on for an hour, and they called me. So John Erling said, hey, sorry to put you on the spot, but he said we have 30 seconds. He said, could you tell me why you believe in recent literal uh, six-day creationism? And he, he literally, he said, we have a commercial break in 30 seconds. I said, oh, I'd love to answer that. I said, I believe in literal creationism because Jesus did. That took 10 seconds. There was a long pause. And he said, we'll be right back to you after our commercial break. He says, I'm intrigued. He said, I didn't know Jesus ever commented on that. And so I, I spent about a half hour with him on the air. And you know what? About five minutes into our talk, we heard... Well, John, I've got to go. <laughs> I'm busy here. And the other guy hung up because he was fed up with it. But let me show you. This is what I normally do. Go to Exodus chapter 20, and I want to explain why you don't need to debate anybody about yom, the, the Hebrew word for yom. It says, for in six yoms. Uh, the, the Hebrew word for day is the word yom. And so what Genesis says is, um, for in, you know, Day one, Yom one, Yom two, Yom three. And so what the, this group, the Hugh Ross clan, say, that those were like day ages. Uh, and, and so they call it um, theistic evolution. That, that God, that's the theistic part, uh, kind of planted a garden and let it grow for six billion years or 18 billion or 12 or however long. So they, it's kind of like you get both. You know, you get the billions and billions of years, and you still have the Bible. And they do that because they say that Yom, there are expressions like the day of the Lord. That's all the way through the Bible. The book of Joel, the whole theme of it is the day of the Lord. Does that mean 
a 24-hour period. No, it doesn't. Clearly it doesn't. And so they go, because in Joel, Yom is an indeterminate amount of time, then every time it shows up in Genesis, it's indeterminate too. And I, you know what I say to them? You know, keep talking as long as you want. And they get all done with that. And I say, okay, let's go to Exodus 20. And, and look at this. This is probably the most well-known part of the Bible. I mean, everybody believes that this is in the Bible. You call it the Ten Commandments, you know. And, and look what the Ten Commandments say in Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words. And by the way, chapter 19 and verse 18, there are three million people shaking and quaking, and they're hearing God's voice talking. And God is talking, and while he's talking, he he actually, it says later in Exodus, that he actually put his finger into stone and he wrote the Ten Commandments. God wrote them with his own finger. It's the only part of the Bible God wrote. You ever think of that? The rest was inspired, and, and the Spirit of God moved and, and gave the words to people. But God did not take pen in hand to write the other 31,000 verses of the Bible. But these verses, starting in chapter 20, with 3 million people, 600,000 families, shaking in their boots because the mountain was quaking and the voice of God was like this loud trumpet, God spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, Exodus 20, and verse 2, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall love, or you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself carved images. Verse 7 is the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. And the fourth commandment is in verse 8, and look what it says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Now, look what we just bumped into. We bumped into this word from Genesis, yom. And what we find is there's a law of interpretation. If you look up every usage of yom in the Bible, you get your computer and use yom. Whenever yom has before it an ordinal, a number, whenever it has a number, always, always, not even most of the time, always, it's talking about what it's talking about here. So look what it says. For uh, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day to the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. But the fourth commandment doesn't stop there. Look what it says in verse 11. And, and this is... Genesis 31, 18 says, this was written by God's finger. I mean, you ought to mark that in your Bible next time someone comes. It's Genesis 31, 18. says that the finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments in the stone tablets. Look what God wrote. For in six yams, days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh yom. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Let me ask you, when 600,000 dads, 603,000 dads, and 603,000 moms, and all their children first heard Moses reading what was on the stone tablets, what did those slaves understand God, those former slaves who worked in Egypt, understand God to say. He was saying, hey, you guys aren't going to be working seven days a week like you did in Egypt. You're going to remember me and, and have intimate time with me. You only have to work six days and rest the seventh. Because I, God wrote with his own finger, I made the entire universe. I created, look what he says, the heavens and the earth. Not just recreated Hugh Ross style, a pre existing universe and spiffed it up and, you know, started the first human. God says in six days, just like I said in Genesis, but just in case you didn't get it, I'll amplify it. In six solar 24 hour days, I made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that's in them, and rested the seventh 24 hour period. So, 
really, this question comes down to who do you believe? Do you believe people that were not eyewitnesses? Do you believe people that are trying to accommodate evolutionary thought? Or do you believe the one who witnessed the creation of both Adam and the universe, who actually with his own finger wrote the account? And so when I got done telling that to John Erling, he said, did Jesus believe anything else? I said, yeah, he believed in Jonah and the whale. And I said, he believed. And he went, oh, we're going to have to have you on another time. But he never did. But it was the first time that a, an unbeliever was confronted with the fact that this, this notion that you can't understand the Bible and you don't know what the Bible means and none of us can be sure that if you start with a marker point of Jesus Christ and if you say Jesus Christ believed in creation, Jesus Christ believed in and, and you, the scriptures, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament scriptures. He had the 22 books that are our 39 that Ezra wrote, and Jesus called them scripture. And then he says, you apostles are going to write the rest of scripture. So basically, Jesus affirmed the whole Bible. He picked the apostles to write, and he said all the Old Testament was his word. So, uh, so next Sunday night, Lord willing, if we're all here, we're going to pick up with Christian and alcohol. I'll give you the Christian's uh, drinking prescription from the scriptures. And it's very clear. The Bible is very clear about that. And if you don't want to come back next week, I'll tell you this. It says elders are not supposed to be near this stuff. Deacons aren't supposed to drink too much. And everybody else isn't supposed to get drunk. That's what the Bible says. And Jesus really made real alcohol. But most people never drank it straight. Only alcoholics drank it straight. The Jews, and if you know anything about the Mishnah and the Gemara and all the Talmudic laws, they always diluted alcohol. That's why they said on the day of Pentecost, how are those people drunk? It's only nine in the morning. You know, when you drank diluted stuff, you'd have, to have five pitchers to get drunk because everyone diluted it. But we'll talk about, bigger than the Christian and alcohol, the whole idea of what do we allow ourselves to be under the control of. There are a lot of people that don't drink anything, but they're totally gluttons, and they're absolutely enslaved to food. Other people are totally enslaved to you know, all kinds of stuff. It's not just alcohol, it's, it's being disciplined. And then we'll talk about the whole mosaic thing and then Romans 9, uh, all Israel being saved and we'll get into Zechariah and prophecy and uh, maybe even Ahmadinejad will do something crazy and it'll be even more exciting next week from Iran. But uh, um, thank you and sorry to make you sit so long without moving. Let's all stand and I'm gonna close in prayer and after I close in prayer, Hannah's gonna come up and Jeff and whoever else is coming, and Justin, and uh, we're, we're going to hear about all this. But while they get ready to come, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you that we have a sure word that we hold in our hand. And I pray that the weight of all your word would rest upon our hearts, that we would want to, to read every word, not live by mere bread, but by every word of God, and that we would see it all fits and the longer we, we study it, the clearer it becomes that you are God and how much we magnify your great name. You are the creator, you are the redeemer, and you are coming again as judge. And we want to please you in all we do. And so we submit ourselves to you tonight, asking you by your grace to give us the power, the desire, and, and Lord, the, the ability to say no to sin and yes to your wonderful plans in this book. Thank you for these that are going, for Hannah and for our high school missions team. And as we send them off tonight, may they go knowing that they're surrounded by the prayer of the saints and by the blessings of you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.